Breaking news concerning the U.S. economy. And it's gone. Uh, what? It's gone. It's all gone. Not socialism. All right, let's not panic. And it's gone. I'll make the money back by selling one of my livers. I can get by with one. Government should be a partner. Ha 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 partner. I don't need. I don't need. I don't need, I don't need anybody's money. It's nice. I'm really rich. And it's gone. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode seven of the Global Crypto Podcast with Luno. I'm James. And hey, we're six episodes in now. You know the deal. Please subscribe. Please share. And of course, get this out to your friends. We're not going to take too much longer. You know who is on this episode. It's all there for you to see. Arthur Hayes, BitMix. Let's do it. Let's hear from our sponsors, Luno. Ready to start your crypto journey? You can instantly buy and sell Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies on Luno. No experience needed. As simple as shopping online. Sign up today with the safe and easy way to buy, store, and learn about cryptocurrency. Go to www.luno.com or download the Luno app. T's and C's apply. Cryptocurrencies are volatile and unpredictable. Never risk more than you're willing to lose. Born 380 miles west of New York City, from humble beginnings and a diverse career in international trading and banking, the CEO of the most loved and at times hated crypto exchange in the world, the basis for multiple copycats, BitMEX. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Arthur Hayes. Arthur, welcome to the Global Crypto Podcast. Thank you for having me. So, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about your geographical history of yourself and BitMEX as well. Um, tell us about your eagerness to travel when leaving college. I mean, it's not very common for American college kids to want to travel internationally. What was it that made you want to travel? So I was a Chinese studies person. I wasn't a minor, I didn't take enough classes, but I actually studied the language for two years at university. And I decided that during my junior year, I wanted to go abroad to the mainland China. However, the program that my university was partnered with in Shanghai was full immersion, and I wasn't fluent enough to, to do that. So I did the second best thing, and I went to Hong Kong because everyone spoke English. So I went over to Hong Kong in the fall of 2006 uh, for a semester abroad and had the most amazing time ever, met some really good people, partied my ass off, and I decided that I wanted to make um, that city my my home uh, after graduation. And obviously I had a more of a bent towards the economic resurgence of China and trying to capture it uh, on that wave and uh, definitely wanted to bring myself over to the region. And so luckily I was able to find an internship my junior summer in Hong Kong with Deutsche Bank. And that was sort of the springboard towards my eventual relocation out to Hong Kong in 2008. And what about what's happening right now? I mean, you've now been entrenched in the culture for so long. I'm sure you're aware, uh, keenly aware of the the nuances of the socio-political climate at the moment. How do you feel about uh, the the shifts taking place in the city at the moment? Does it make you as a, as a business leader based in Hong Kong feel a little insecure or do you have confidence they'll be able to resolve it? So Hong Kong has always been an international trading center and sort of the the gateway to China, kind of like a legal arb. You take British common law, put it on a rock, uh, and then allow capital flow in and out of uh, China to the West. And that role has obviously shifted uh, since 1997. And I think really, if you take the China equation out of it, like most places around the world, you have a population that has been shut out from the real estate and job markets because of um, really, really high prices. And you have young people graduating from university, they earn very little money and they have very little chance of ever owning their own property, moving out of, you know, essentially their parents' home until they get married. So I think if you take that backdrop against what's been happening around the world with the lack of economic mobility in the face of massive wealth creation, um, it's one of the most unequal places in the world. It's no surprise that um, whether it's China or some other outside influence is able to galvanize a population that feels that they have nothing to lose from the current way that the system is working. So I think it's a mistake to color this as a China versus 
Hong Kong thing, you know, the local Hong Kong elites have sort of almost failed their, their city because the people there just don't feel an attachment to the way things have worked, regardless of who was in charge, whether it was the British or the Chinese or however the politically the situation evolves. So I think that's really the, the story here to get wrapped up in the whole China thing as a distraction from essentially an uneconomically mobile population that the, that's highly educated. Your essay that you wrote exactly two months to the day, actually, it was on the 9th of April that you brought it out, really spoke to the macroeconomic picture happening globally at the moment. And how do you think this current global uh, depression, which it seems like we're moving into in light of what the, the COVID-19 pandemic has sort of catalyzed. How do you think that's going to play out globally? Well, I think it's going to get worse. And the problem is that people are looking at the stock markets around the world as a barometer of economic health. And there's a researcher that I, I listen to his podcast every fortnight when he publishes called Jim Bianco. And his whole thing is that we need to get back to 95 to 98% of where we were in January 2020 for this not to be, at least in the U.S. context, one of the worst economic recessions since the founding of the country. Wow. And so if you take a look at China or Europe or any other major economic bloc, 80% recovery is a depression. Um, if you think about a business, which business has a 20% margin these days. I think most restaurants are between the 5 to 10% range. Most manufacturing companies are in the 15% range. So if you're telling me that 20% of your revenue has evaporated, but the bank still wants their money, um, your investors still, who own your debt still want their coupon payments, how are you going to be able to do that? And regardless of the amount of money that's printed from a you know, fiscal or monetary standpoint, that doesn't replace the lost demand out there. And I think that's really the, the dichotomy that people are seeing. All oh, the S&P is, you know, almost back to 3,400, yet there's 30 million, 40 million unemployed people in, in the U.S., for example. So I think it's only going to get worse and you're going to get a lot more inflation because essentially what you've had is supply has contracted, right? Because businesses are not producing as much because they don't have the financing or they, you know, because couldn't survive the two to three months of lockdown. And you're going to most governments, at least are going to support people by giving them checks in the mail saying, don't go out in the streets, don't protest, don't get mad at us here. Here's some, some money that we created out of thin air that we printed. So go about your life. So Demand is supported, less supply equals inflation. And we know that the people who bear the brunt of inflation the worst are the low and middle income people. What are their solutions? Is it entrepreneurship? Is it going back to community-based economies? Well, unfortunately, usually the solution is some sort of social upheaval. And I think that's what we're, we're seeing around the globe where you've had wages um, essentially stagnant since the 70s manufacturing offshore to a cheaper location and income eroded uh, from middle income earners. And in the face of technology and a lot of these other deflationary aspects, I think people are going to reach to blaming the other, whatever that may be in the location they're based. And that sort of anger, unfortunately, will be usually be channeled by some sort of political figure towards a nefarious end. And so while I think, you know, if you think about it, you have supporting community, doing these sort of things, these longer term solutions. Well, the longer term, it's, they've always been problems with longer term. And now we're 30, 40 years into this whole globalization experiment, yet people are still no better off than they were. So why are they going to wait longer? Let's uh, talk a little bit about your work at BitMix. When you first had the idea to build a cryptocurrency derivatives platform, did you have any idea that your platform would offer the most traded cryptocurrency derivative product of all time only five years later? I definitely didn't think that this market would develop this quickly. I think 2017 really happened on everyone by surprise. We're all really happy that we made it to $1,000 Bitcoin. And if you look back at the different problems that the ecosystem faced, whether it be the issues with China and the PBOC um, kind of banning ICOs and taking down the spot pr trading prices, the um, Bitcoin cash fork, um, all these sort of things 
happened in that year, yet the price went up to you know twenty thousand at the high, and so that I think ushered in the era of of derivatives. And then 2018, 2019 is when things really cemented where people moved away from trading spot and traded on the margin derivatives because things weren't going up, the ICOs weren't going up, um, Bitcoin wasn't going up, and we started to see that just like in every other market, the derivative contracts trade in excess of the spot. So I don't think there's ever a question that if crypto was a thing to survive, that der derivatives would supplant spot as a major volume uh, grabber. The question was how much time. And I was very surprised that after you know five years, you're doing billions of dollars a day on, on these instruments. But even still, I think global FX trades $7 trillion a day. We have a long way to go. What about the competition? Did you consider the competition in those early days? And if so, what was the plan to keep your edge? So when we started in 2014, you know, we definitely were not the first platform to offer um, Bitcoin derivatives. Um, the first platform that I know of was called ICBit. And they started, I think, in either 2010 or 2011. Uh, and then there were some Chinese platforms that came on in 2013. 796 was one of them. Um, and OK, Huobi, BTC China, they all launched their derivatives offerings around around the same time. So we weren't the first. I think where you know we took some learnings from other players who you know had the socialized loss model, and what we really did was make leverage really high. So we went from three times leverage to 100 times leverage in October of 2015, and that started to to make our name for ourselves. And I think the quality of the technology that we built and the mathematical correctness, which at some times diminishes performance, which you're seeing today meant that we were able to run a platform that didn't lose didn't lose us any money, meaning that we didn't have to come out of our own pocket for deficiencies in how we built the thing. And I think that shows in our insurance fund, which is, you know, 35,000, 36,000 Bitcoin, which acts as a safety mechanism to ensure that people actually can uh, get paid out. And I think that's a testament to the ability of building something correct um, that works and not taking shortcuts. Your stance on Bitcoin itself is pretty bullish. Um, could you take us back to uh, the younger Arthur, um, a still derivatives and financial market maker? When was the first time that you realized the power of Bitcoin? Describe for us your penny drop moment. So I've always been uh, into gold. Um, I learned a very um, good lesson about sizing um, in 2012, 2013, when I, well, 2012, when I bought a lot of physical gold, basically at the peaks, uh, lost by Jagger and the price went down 40%. So I obviously had to, to sell it a, a massive loss and avoid that pension for, you know, hard money, um, dislike of um, monetary quantitative easing, whatever you want to call it. So when I finally read about Bitcoin in 2013 and the Zero Hedge article, it, it kind of piqued my interest. And once I eventually got let go from Citibank, then I had the time on my hands to investigate what's actually going on in this ecosystem. And what really dawned on me was I saw a once in probably two or three hundred year opportunity where um, society transitions between a different type of money or, you know, from commodity to paper and these sort of uh, Transitions are volatile, but extremely profitable for uh, a few players. And I saw this transition from physical paper, physical gold to sort of a digital representation of value and transferring that value without um, third party having to, ex to give you permission. I saw that it's extremely uh, empowering and I wanted to be at the forefront of that change because it's going to be Good things and bad things will happen. There'll be winners and losers, but that's where you make um, serious generational wealth is in those transition periods if you can survive. That's a key question. How do people in the middle class survive what's coming? Well, obviously, um, save, uh, upgrading of, of skill skill sets, right? We're, we're in a a digital economy, what does that mean and wherever you are in terms of what you can do for yourself? And I think question assumptions on what, why you think certain things are done, right? This is the time where in the next decade, you know, 
system that we took for granted for the last 30 years might not be present uh, in the next 10. And how is that going to affect your life? How is it going to affect the form of government? So don't keep your head, put your head in the sand and expect everything to stay the same. I think the only constant is change and it's going to be accelerated with the advent of computing everybody on their mobile phones, everybody interconnected. We're going to see the rate of change um, accelerate uh, versus other times when you have sort of a rewriting of the social contract. All right, we're going to take a very short break, 30 seconds only. When we come back, we're going to hear Arthur's predictions for Bitcoin's price come the end of 2020. For fast local bank deposits and withdrawals, advanced charting tools, and API access for automated trading, sign up with Luno, Africa's most trusted, secure, and reliable crypto exchange. Go to www.luno.com or download the Luno app. Ranked in the global top 10 exchanges by Crypto Compare. T's and C's apply. Cryptocurrencies are volatile and unpredictable. Never risk more than you're willing to lose. Okay, we're back. Arthur, coming back to uh, what you've mentioned before regarding your essay two months ago, your long Bitcoin and gold, because not only are they deflationary by nature, but uh, their competing fiat currencies are hyperinflated, right? Um, we recently had macroeconomist Raul Powell on the show, and he stands by his belief that it won't be too long until we see $900,000 Bitcoin prices. Is that kind of figure still possible in your mind? Absolutely. I think it's, but I think it's a mistake to actually try to put a price target on it. If you're just a regular investor in, in, in crypto, or sorry, not crypto, Bitcoin, you really have to look at it as a binary outcome. Either the technology fails at scale and, you know, governments get their shit together and everything's happy and everybody gets along, Bitcoin's worth zero. Or it's worth, you know, something less than infinity. And that's the asymmetric uh, opportunity that it, that is Bitcoin. The price target is sort of irrelevant. Buy some Bitcoin, put it away for 10 years, come back and see what happened. Um, I think that's probably the, the best way to approach it if you're trying to you know, put a small amount of money, whatever you can afford, into this ecosystem and taking a bet. Because you're really just taking a bet. And I think there's still a huge amount of asymmetry in that bet. Um, but that's what you're really doing. You know, day trading in and out, that requires a lot more attention and um, your full-time job, maybe, if you want to call it that. But I would say that putting a small amount of money away that you're willing to lose, and it's either a zero or something less than infinity. Now, we've seen big-name players start to warm up to the idea of Bitcoin. Uh, Paul Tudor Jones comes to mind. But why is there still such vehement criticism of Bitcoin? Is it just a case of tribalism that's embedded within the human psyche? I think usually, if you're talking about an institutional investor crowd, why do they you know, continue to, to poo-poo Bitcoin, why don't they own it in one of their funds? At the end of the day, it's really about career risk. So the, their job is to raise as much many assets as possible and charge a management fee and exist off of that. And performance is kind of irrelevant. So they can't be um, wrong when everyone else is right. So you can't be long in Bitcoin in end of 2017 to 2019 when it goes down 80% and the S&P performed, I don't know, 20 or 30%. Um, that, that's when you lose your job. Um, if Bitcoin goes from a thousand to you know ten thousand in 2017, yeah, you pat yourself on the back. Unless you went long like a billion dollars, it's not going to not going to move the needle. So the risk for a fund manager for Bitcoin is always at this point to the downside because everybody has the same view. Everybody knows that everybody knows that Bitcoin is only used for terrorist scams, money laundering, you know, this, that, and the other thing. The, the usual thing that people um, down talk Bitcoin for. But when everybody knows that everybody knows that Bitcoin is used to fight inflation and that narrative shifts, then it's acceptable for you to own what was once hated now and now is loved. And then, you know, by definition, most fund managers are average. And if you're a highly paid person who's average, the last thing you want to do is lose that job by trying to move outside your lane. Your your blog, the Crypto Trader Digest series, um, that article entitled Choose Your Fiction spoke about your portfolio and your positions. Um, and uh, the since that article, the U.S. stock market has rallied to unprecedented highs in the midst of this global pandemic. Have you changed your portfolio since then? So I was having this conversation with a good friend of mine the other day, and I kind of summed up my 
position. So on the one hand, you have politics and, and central banks, and they're able to influence things in the right now. They're able to print money and buy assets and inflate the market and do do things to uh, um, to conceal what I call math, right? The math just doesn't work. If I have trillions more dollars chasing a finite amount of assets, they, they go up. If I have 80% activity in an economy, I have a lot of people going out of business. So the question is, I like to trade on the side of math because predicting politics in the central banks, it's a very difficult thing to do correctly um, well over time. But the problem with math is it takes a very long time for you to be right. And in that very long time, you a lot of people get to go bankrupt because if you bet the house on something that's mathematically correct, but the government and the central bank is against you, it's going to be very difficult for you to make money. So I, you know, when I talk about my portfolio in my uh, articles, I usually try to always be long options. And so I know exactly how much money I stand to lose. Um, I try to keep, you know, extend the duration of those options so I have time to, to be proven correct. So you know, I have all the same trades on uh, that I had you know, when the S&P was at you know, 2,500 or 2,600. And I'm just going to see if math is going to win in the next one to two years or politics versus central banks. And so that's the bet that I'm, I'm taking. And I'm actually adding to some of those positions now as balls have come down and the levels have gotten better because everybody's so um, they're in belief mode that you know, when you take 80% of the economy offline, that somehow that's not going to lead to massive amounts of bankruptcies and social unrest. Speaking of social unrest, no one could have predicted the activist protests that came straight after George Floyd's tragic murder. How do these protests affect the global economy, if at all? Well, at the end of the day, I think it's the social contracts being uh, rewritten. Uh, the fact that um, a black man in America was killed by the police is nothing new. It's been happening for hundreds of years. The question now is, now that everyone's seen it on their mobile phone and they're stuck in their house and they're kind of questioning, you know, why am I doing this lockdown thing for? There's all this pent-up energy. There's all this pent-up rage. The government shut down my job, right? They, they told my business that employed me that it could no longer open. And now I'm sitting here hoping that I get a check at the end of the month. And so I think when you take that sort of, um, distrust and angst in the government, and you amplify it with um, the murder of this person by the people who are supposed to protect people, that I think strikes a raw nerve. And now you're seeing people vent grievances that have nothing to do with um, structural racism in the United States all across the world because they have their own issues that is brought on by this dislocation uh, that COVID has you know, brought upon you know, the entire globe. So I think it's a spark and it's a getting people to reevaluate the things in their particular context that are upsetting them. You've spoken numerous times this year about Bitcoin hitting around about the $20,000 zone before the end of 2020. Has anything changed since then to impact your thesis? No, I still think that it definitely can reach that level. I think people are a little perplexed as to why we're spending so much time trying to break 10,000. We've you know, tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed. But if you think about 2017, we spent the sum total of, I think, two or three weeks over the $10,000 level. It went from, you know, 1,000 to 10,000 by the end of November, from 10,000 to 20,000 within two weeks. So that $10,000 level has not really been held properly for a long amount of time. And a lot of people have entry prices in that 2017 era in the 10 to $15,000 range. So we're going to spend a lot of time uh, at this level. But I have, if I have to think about the trillions of dollars that are being um, created to buy bonds to push yields to zero or negative, you're going to start seeing people shift capital to other assets. And some of that is going to leak in, into Bitcoin. And so I am confident that we can you know, take this $10,000 level and, and get to the 20000 mark and beyond by the end of the year. All right. And uh, Arthur, just as we bring things for a close in this episode, how would you, as the CEO of BitMix, explain your insurance fund to the average trader? To the average trader. The insurance fund is there to help people who have winning positions earn the full amount of the unrealized P&L. Wow. As simple as that. Nice and simple. Well summarized. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, now, Stacey Herbert, I, I'm... 
sure or I'd imagine that you'd know who she is, uh, Max Kaiser's wife, uh, host, co-host of the Kaiser Report on Russia Today. Uh, what would you ask Stacey? I would want to know what she thinks is the most exciting non-Bitcoin project uh, for 2020 that, that, she, that she has seen. That is a fantastic question. What about you? What is your most exciting project that is non-Bitcoin? When you say Bitcoin, are you talking non-crypto or non-Bitcoin itself? Could it be a crypto product? No, within within the yeah, a crypto product within okay. the Bitcoin within the ecosystem, but not not Bitcoin uh, specifically. And what's your most exciting product that you've seen? Hmm. I actually have not seen anything. I haven't looked at any other new projects. I mean, I know I know what's in the top, you know, five or ten by market cap, but that really hasn't changed. So I'm always looking to see, hear what the the new new thing is. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Arthur, thank you so much for your time. This has been incredibly valuable. It really has been an extraordinary chat, and uh, we wish you all the best in the further development of Bitmix. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Cheers. And there you go, Arthur Hayes. What a great guy. What a sharp mind. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We appreciate all the support. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. We appreciate all of your contributions to making Global Crypto who we are. Next week, it is Stacey Herbert, wife of Max Kaiser of the Kaiser Report. There are a couple of scheduling conflicts which we're trying to work around. So if we don't get Stacey in time, we may have a highlights reel for episode eight, but we are doing everything we can to make sure we get Stacey in time. If not, she will be on possibly in two weeks time. So keep it locked to our Twitter channel at Global Crypto TV, and you'll find out all the details there as to what is happening. We'll catch you in the next edition. Thanks again, as always, for your support. Until then, goodbye. Breaking news concerning the U.S. economy. And it's gone. Uh, what? It's gone. It's all gone. Not socialism. All right, let's not panic. And it's gone. I'll make the money back by selling one of my livers. I can get by with one. Government should be a partner. Pa- pa- partner. I don't need. I don't need. I don't need anybody's money. It's nice. I'm really rich. Bandit's guy.